Hello everybody, I'm The Theorizer, and this is the third compilation video of my Mort theory on Mort from DreamWorks, yes, the lemur. This is when things get very, very, very good, but I have to warn you, this will make no sense at all unless you have seen the previous five hours worth of theories. <laughs> It all makes perfect sense. It's insane. But you should have, in fact, watched the first two, you know, compiled segments, because this is the third segment when everything connects. You have been warned. In the build-up to the grand part 26 of my Mort theory, today we are going to recap Every single thing that has occurred to get us where we are now at the final connection segment. Yes, this is for new people who have no idea what I'm talking about. This is for old people who want a refresher. This is being posted in the vague name of coherence and sanity. So what is the Mort theory? Well, simply put, parts one to six, AKA this compilation video is sort of volume one, where we cover Mort the lemur from Madagascar. He is pretty unsuspecting and normal in the movies, but in the spin-off shows, he is absolutely shocking. He is obscene. They give him some of the most complicated sci-fi backstory stuff, all as an elaborate funny. So I stitched it together. Interestingly, most of it is very structured and planned out. There are even some episodes that are more drama series than comedy skit. Very interesting, but in part one I you know, planned it out. Thought it would take four hours and 15 videos, but now we're way beyond that. All I did was read his wiki page, but in parts two to four we actually watched through the entire show, All Hail King Julian, and I grabbed every piece of lore I could get my hands on. Part 5, we also did this for the Penguins of Madagascar TV show. Once we had all this evidence, things got really crazy. The shows talk about parallel universes and thousands of Mort clones being absorbed into his psyche, weird genetics like how he's part spider and alternate dimensions colliding with warlords and intellectuals alike. Very chaotic. Very epic. Very surprising from a side character like this, so I crashed it all together in part 6, rounding off this first volume, let's say, by coming to a series of very well substantiated conclusions about the show. In short, the show describes how Mort is an interdimensional godlike being who has been around since the beginning of time. He has quarrels and battles with the sky gods of Madagascar, which are represented by a pantheon of fruits up in heaven. Mort was a threat to reality, so they splintered him across the multiverse, and slowly but surely, Fragments of Mort are finding each other again and reabsorbing into more powerful entities like Mordicus Khan and Smart Mort and, most notably, our Mort, who after losing one of these battles wiped his own memory and stashed himself among some clones as a petty mouse lemur in Madagascar. Mort is essentially the creator of the entire world from a higher dimension, but is a bit of a malicious demon and ultimately is hinted at to be death itself, the Grim Reaper. Following Volume 1, I dragged in tons of older theories of mine into the playlist. Why? Well, because during all this, there were a ridiculous number of hints that connect things to other DreamWorks films and shows too. So in preparation to explain these connections and how they expand on Mort's more important story, I dragged in my Shrek timeline, my four theories on the fairy godmother, my theory on the trumpet player from Shrek 2, and my two theories on donkeys mutant babies. Through all of this, we essentially cover how the fairy godmother was actually behind Fiona's curse, and she did it because she was out to rule far, far away to get revenge on the people who ruled it before the films. This would be Queen Lillian's family, her father, mother, siblings, etc. She hated them because she had an affair with them that led to the birth of her son, Prince Charming. This also covers how her magic works, how Rumpelstiltskin's connected to her, and how they have a secret sort of organization that controls all sources of magic so they can transcend universes and become like gods on Earth. Her magic created life and allowed Donkey's kids to exist because of her potion that he drank. Her shady organization has infiltrated everything at this point, and almost all of the Shrek villains are a part of it. They have codes that they share through music and comedy, mainly. Their goal is to crush fairy tale animals and usurp the monarchy. They're everywhere. Following the Shrek videos, I dragged in my older theories on the humans of the Madagascar films, and also my theory on how the humans in Over the Hedge are a part of something greater. Essentially, the old woman and the French officer are related and a part of the same group. The same applies to the exterminator from Over the Hedge. This all culminated in part 17 when I finally made a new video and tied all of it into Mort. You see, I had reason to believe that the Fairy Godmother's organization was the same group as the one Nana Dubois and the Verminator were a part of. 
Not only that, but traces of this group are found in almost every single DreamWorks film, and contains almost every single DreamWorks villain. The ultimate goal? Crush animal intelligence. That's the plot of almost all these films. Not only that, but the coded jokes and music aren't the only big link here. There's one that's even more important, and it's that this whole organization seems to be localized out of France. The racer from Turbo is French, the Verminator is French, the animal officer is French, the lawyer from the bee movie suppressing the bees has a French name, and it bleeds into every single film in ways that sound crazy at first, but then it doesn't stop. It just keeps going. My understanding is that DreamWorks intentionally or not made this pattern with all their villains, and there is an extremely clean way to connect all of them that makes it feel like it's at least partly intentional, joke or not. The kicker? Mort, or rather death, is at the core of animal intelligence. Death brings back nature, destroys the industrialization of humanity. The gods have created this organization to stop him. So I dragged in my three theories on Megamind. You see, in these older theories of mine, I determined that the entire city is in on a conspiracy to force Metro Man and Megamind to fight each other so that they can stay safe in the middle. They don't want these aliens taking over. On top of that, Megamind's home planet also has some mysteries, and it ties into how his minion seems to have the transplanted brain of Megamind's family servant. Hello, I'm the Theorizer. I like mystery, history, and long walks on the omniversal fabric. I also like roasting Lovecraftian demons on skewers, or so my meme desperation would imply. So we're currently at around the 5 hour and 15 minute mark of this Mort playlist, and things can finally get interesting -er. I'll have you know that I've reached the point of being, well, just speechless. Tenfold more than I was even in that alien cult video, because things are finally getting real. Commenters delivered a lot of nifty stuff, a lot of stuff I've been hinting at for this video, but a lot of stuff that has completely slipped my mind as well. There were even a couple things I didn't register until I found them autonomously, but for the key ones that go to commenters, I will credit it as such. Unfortunately, there were lots of repeat points, so I'm not sure who to credit with what and when. We'll see how the evidence plays out, but luckily most of this is just the culmination of my years of foreshadowing, because it once again appears as though I have stumbled upon something horrifying, and this time, something that permeates through all of DreamWorks. Time to explain myself. I have been referencing something, building to something. A freelance organization funded by the gods that seeks to suppress animal intelligence and more importantly the core of them all, the faceless being of destruction, Mort himself. This video is going to have far more offhand revelations than usual, which is to say that there will be many game-changing twists here that I will not dwell on, but hope you will wrap your head around as quickly as possible. So we can quickly start off with the gigantic titan snail that the Bell Gods warship. As it turns out, this crazy development from All Hail King Julian is explicitly connected to both Turbo and Monsters vs. Aliens, which is a revelation I exhumed in tandem with a viewer on Twitter. You see, last time I deemed Monsters vs. Aliens to be a critical chunk in the DreamWorks timeline given how it displays the issues of forced evolution in humanity. It contains such important developments as the missing link, or the attempted creation of a sentient entity, or the mutation of insects, and Susan. The implication is that humans are on a sort of path, trying, intentionally and not, to force evolve themselves unnaturally, and the results are problematic. Beings like Dr. Cockroach doing what he does, failing like he fails. This is the Monsters vs. Aliens piece. The Turbo piece, however, is something we went into a bit deeper last time. In Turbo, the plotline is basically a French race car driver facing off against snails. The rise in animal intelligence is the snails, and he is the faceless organization's representative in said film. Pause quickly. I will hereby stop referring to this faceless organization as a faceless organization. For many months now, on Twitter and on my second channel, and to myself, I have referred to them as what they are. The France Established Exterminator Terminators. Why do I call them this? Because it's what they are, damn it. But it's a long title, so I've just been calling them by their acronym, FEET because they are Mort's weakness. Oh, my goosebumps have goosebumps. Have I outdone myself? No, not really. 
All right, so Gigogne is a part of the Feet organization, very obviously, very clearly. And on Twitter, me and user at doom 4 zombies had an enlightening conversation about the nature of oxymoronic gastropods. And I'm not talking about Gary. <laughs> not today, anyway. There's something here. Do you see the connection? The French eat snails. This is a critical plot point seen everywhere, most notably in All Hail King Julian, where we discover that the world's most intelligent snails have departed to Madagascar so as to evade French cuisine. It's fascinatingly specific. Here's the big one, though. At the very end of Monsters vs. Aliens, we get another one of those pesky offhand comments. This time, it's from the General. The General's existence is identical to the idea of a secret international organization revolving around the assimilation of evolved to humans. That's literally the plot of the film. His offhand comment, that's what gets me though. The general ends the movie by saying he needs the monsters on another mission already, and guess what that mission is? Taking down a giant snail named Escar Gantua. This is exactly like Jingle Jangle, and can you guess where this is happening? Can you possibly, for the life of you, guess where this giant, force-evolved, mutated snail is wreaking havoc? France. <sighs> Nuclear mutation is also a subplot of All Hail King Julian in the episode where they mutate the mango into literally becoming a conscious Lovecraftian beast that absorbs people, and then they nuke it to pieces. Mutation, Lovecraft beast, mango just like this guy got fruits. All of these plot threads and a couple more are so entangled with every DreamWorks film that it's quite frightening, actually. So maybe we shouldn't be letting Madagascar off the hook so easy. Is there more to its core I've been missing, perhaps? As I determined in my traumatic viewing of All Hail King Julian, the Sky Gods are localized to Madagascar because of, most likely, Mort. There's little doubt in my mind that this is the case, of course. The fruits reign supreme over the Sky God's heaven because they are them. This was one of several conclusions during my original six Mort videos. They are keeping tabs and have pinned Mort here so as to gain the upper hand. A small leap in any other canon, but a graceful stepping stone here. I have great reason to believe that one of the main reasons Madagascar has evolved differently than the rest of the world, why it has profoundly unique wildlife, being the only place in the entire world to have lemurs in it, is because of the Sky Gods. I'm telling you, they're doing this. It's the way DreamWorks has unfolded the lore in their story. Clever as all hell, it roots back to Mort. As smart Mort is aware of the Sky Gods, Mort knows, and parts of him are unruly, hence this whole mess in the first place. Mordecai's Khan, anyone? Suppression. But the big question. How do the French tie into all this? What, 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 like, how does this organization that is so desperate to stop animal intelligence, how do they play into all this? It's quite simple, really. If you haven't guessed, they are aligned with the Sky Gods. I'm certain. But now we know it must have even more weight than previously anticipated because we see humans in All Hail King Julian studying Mort. They rip him from his habitat and come back night after night analyzing him. He is genetically anomalous, which is to say he is without a species, or rather, that Mort is every species at once, evenly distributing his intelligence so he can return to form with an army of his own, the entire animal kingdom. This is why they wear freaking hazmat suits for a tiny-ass mouse lemur. We've been over this. Scientists can't classify him, his genetics are alien. Mort states this in show. This is known. But now we're on the receiving end of the theorizing. This human angle. They're all tied in here just as hard, and if you don't believe me, get a load of Madagascar's official national language, French. Spoken only in tandem with the native language, Malagasy, they speak French because Madagascar was colonized by France itself. And if you still don't believe me, get this. The penguins, who I determined to be on the forefront of this war for animal intelligence, end the third film by shipping the Feet Organization's very own lead general to Madagascar itself. Dubois in a box sent to the front lines. The snails and their exodus from enemy territory, jingle jangle the mutation angle, the linchpin is that every time humans rise up, there's an animal just waiting there to stop them, with utmost desperation and underhandedness. Each keeps the other in place, and they're so desperate, my god. One are physically powerful, one are mentally powerful, and the war is nested in the overlap. An overlap established and maintained by the true forces in this game, 
Mort and the Sky Gods. This is what I've been trying to say. The France-established Exterminator Terminators have been desensitized into believing that Mort is the ultimate threat. I bet they've been promised immortality. How do I know this? His name is Death, for he is Mort the Lemur. You were all hung up on the fact that he's the Grim Reaper, but not the fact that I keep repeating, which is that Mort means death in French. All Romance languages have a similar sounding origin word, so it has to be one of them, and while Latin is classically cooler sounding, we now know that not to be the case. I keep mentioning this, although thank you commenters for stating it even clearer, as many of you ended up independently concurring. They call him Mort, for he is death the great Grim Reaper that claims them all, the promised evil. As for whether the Sky Gods can genuinely prescribe immortality, I do not know, I do not care. The Feet organization seems to believe it with all their might. Let's not forget, of course, that Nana is also a part of all this, as it is her infamous link to Dubois that I was trying to figure out for three years following that video I made in 2018 on them. This is it. Nana is Russian, a recurring theme in the spin-off show, Oligarch Dolphins, anyone? Remember in part one when I said, speaking of the Soviet Union, this is it. The skills, the madness, the Nana. She's not explicitly French, which is why that video's whole purpose was to serve this link. Force Evolved Exterminator Terminators is more like it, though I'd rather stick to the term I've got already as I found the French connection to be far more critical here. So Madagascar as an island is also a crucial factor here. With that in mind, let's apply our newfound knowledge to the Shrek videos, where we find many candidates with similar motivations, traits, and pattern clicking. Lord Farquaad, for one, fits the bill in at least some ways. Once again, this was something I kind of was iffy on, but commenters, as usual, have bulldozed it into view. The top comment regarding this contained a reply that solidifies Farquaad even harder, as Duloc does seem indeed to be named after a former Quebec city, or in other words, French connection. But the main fact of the matter is that Farquaad's task is literally to eliminate highly evolved intelligent life, and we know that he's not the only purist in this series because the fairy godmother follows suit and has magic, supernatural forces granted to her by who exactly? Unclear. The gods, perhaps? This much we cannot know for certain, but if it is the case, then it's most certainly the baby stages of this whole conspiracy. Let's not forget one of my most insane videos, the Reggie one, which concluded that Merlin and the fairy godmother possibly have an intricate connection between them in the form of a musical meme cult designed to usurp the royals. A cult, you say? Sounds kind of like the medieval beginnings of an organization. Remember how I said Robin Hood looked like Reggie and Farquaad? Robin Hood, the musical man who was so underhandedly desperate to eliminate Shrek, the intelligent evolved animal? Robin Hood, who they for some f***ing reason chose to make French. What? What? Oh no. This means Reggie blared his unbridled snark, as I put it, out of mockery from his disdain at an intelligent beast rising to power, not just because of the monarchy. Also, Charming did the exact same thing when he recruited villains in a cult of his own, one of whom was the evil queen who wanted to open up a spa in France. And did you sincerely think I forgot that insane Puss in Boots cameo in All Hail King Julian? No. How is this possible if not for the anomalous space and time I have now theorized this island island of Madagascar to have. Barring Mort's own interdimensional hyperrealism stunt, this island is reaching and yanking the most intelligent medieval feline threat into its modern battles, similarly to how Reggie was granted a song from the future. And what is Puss in Boots doing here? Singing. A song counter forces from the gods themselves. As it turns out, the Sky Gods also have distinct incarnations appearing in the Puss in Boots spin-off show, at least according to commenter Daniel Adams, who seems to be completely correct if Google is any indication. After reading even more of these comments on the Alien Cult video, I've been tempted to include Aardman Animation's films because the comment section was most filled with them above all else. You see, despite being claymation and very questionably canon, they are riddled to the core with this shit. French frogs spiteful towards humanity and a literal secret underground society with intelligent snails? Check. Chicken Run is the distilled incarnation of my inverted linchpin? Double check. Also, by the way, thanks to six different commenters, it turns out that my lazy hunch was on point, as yes, the B-movie lawyer Montgomery 
also has a name rooted in French. So there's that connection. But speaking of that enigmatic part 17, don't think I forgot about said alien cult's alien role in all this. So now things are taking a step yet further. We get to the Megamind and Galaxar segments. The promise of a thumbnail four months past due. The key connection I was implying near the end of that video has reached its moment, and it's why I've added the Megamind theories to our playlist. Megamind himself is from a solar system with three planets. It is Metro Man's and a mysterious third planet that I deem to be minions. This could well and truly be false, because look at the obvious. We're going all out now, and Galaxar is on the table. Here we have a bluish alien with a massive head, whose planet was destroyed in a cataclysmic event of his own creation. Let's also not ignore the fact that Monsters vs. Aliens was released just one year before Megamind, and thus I'm inclined to say that Galaxar did this. But that's just how the Megamind planet theory ties in. Take a gander at my city theory, wherein the government meticulously subdues aliens so as to keep them fighting one another. Sound familiar? The humans aren't just facing animals, but aliens as well, as expected, I suppose. You see, in my Megamind city theory, I concluded that Metro Man quit upon the realization that he was being used. This is clear and obvious, and it's the city that is responsible. If you don't believe me that this is the case, then you've clearly forgotten about the result of his midlife crisis, an identity known as Music Man. Music Man. Random, right? Wrong. The Sky God's very own musical meme feat cult teachings were instilled into him by this government that's known to be shady from the earliest possible age as a backup plan. How do I know this? Because we see it. He is encouraged to share his singing in the prison systems school. Regardless of whether it's actually good or not, and I'm not even sure what to do with the fact that Metro Man and Farquad look so similar that they've both been memed in the form of Markiplier, like it's absolutely insane how similarly they look, but that is much definitely coincidental I'd say. The alien connection, however, is most certainly not. Aliens are an unforeseen red herring in the eyes of the Feet cult, and this is where Mort ties back in, being the supreme leader of all aliens, and animals, and anything organic and inhuman, basically. We can confirm this even harder using the massive revelation that I somehow forgot, but the comments certainly didn't, that being the fact that Home, a film about an alien invasion, has the aliens assimilating and setting up their headquarters in Paris. Stop doing this to me. Stop doing this to me. Stop it right now. I need to cut away from those alien connections before I absolutely lose it. Let's return to my happy place, the Madagascar films. The penguins fled to Monaco, right? They went undercover with the chimps as a rich human, right? So they could cheat the system and bankrupt their enemy from the inside, France. 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 The penguins know things. The animals have their own organizations. Look no further than the North Wind itself. How is all of this coming together? How is this... How? I returned to these films to evade the stresses of Megamind and Galaxar. <sighs> the penguins get ambushed by Alex and friends, which alerts lead commander Captain Dubois to their presence. As she explains, this is the moment she has been preparing for her entire life, as the Sky Gods have prepared her for this film. Mort's entire life story is tracked and monitored by the gods, and this is a huge blow to the Sky Gods. The big threat was discovered and prepared for, so what is this huge threat? Well, it's obvious. It's an all-animal circus that distracts the masses and dominates entertainment outside of all rules and regulations. Killing the catalyst, Alex, is her life's purpose, and her failure gets her sent to the front lines to be chewed up and spit out like an irrelevant ragdoll. Literally chewed up, by the way, as she is sent as sacrificial food, and she knows it. Look at the sheer horror on her face when she reads Madagascar. And who put the nail in her coffin? Who finalized her defeat? Why, it was none other than the nail in everyone's coffin, the Grim Reaper himself. <laughs> This is my point. The Sky Gods are banning death, Mort himself, but is it necessary? We see the lengths they go to, and Dubois willingly sees herself as Satan. It's amazing how everyone in Monaco just knows Dubois. She's famous, and all she is is an animal control officer? No. She is the most important character in all of DreamWorks. She's so much more. Whereas a regular officer would be shocked and horrified by this monkey-operated plane vehicle, she expects it. She has no shock at the intelligence of animals because she has been preparing for it her entire life. And I'm thrilled because she's probably my favorite DreamWorks character. <sighs> but here might be the wildest revelation of them all. Who does Julian send after Dubois when she's clinging to them? Mort. And then they cut her rope while she hangs hundreds of feet in the air, with Mort staring dead in her soul as she falls damn close to death. Look at that 
grin. Especially compared to Alex's regret, it's like he's the actual devil on his shoulder. Do it, Alex. Kill her, my child. She is a threat to my empire. To the Nirvana of Oblivion. I know this to be true. This mid-air situation here is Melman's dilemma, and Alex is the protagonist, so of course he's there, but this critical scene dwells on Mort as well. Why? Well, given that he is the protagonist of DreamWorks itself, he is just as primary. It's why Julian kicked him down there. Mort shows off his horrifying grin from All Hail King Julian, a show focused heavily on his creepy behavior. It was legitimately a freak coincidence that she fell in this pool, by the way. Alex had no visual behind him, let alone the ability to time this. It's why he showed such glum regret before slicing the rope. The pool is a literal deus ex machina from her gods. Don't believe that she's tied to the supernatural forces? <laughs> How could you not? Do I need to remind you of the fact that she holds a plane back and can literally run through walls to the point where I made a video inconclusively calculating it? She's force evolved. Ever notice how she has the head of Alex, the limbs of Marty, the neck of Melman, and the ever curvaceous bod of Gloria? Dubois being a perfectly balanced absolute unit has finally reached lore significance. It finally happened. Dubois has been preparing for this film's plot her entire life, and she is a literal perfect blend of animals just like Ort. A curvaceous counter-strike. For the love of God, the most unshakable proof I can give you that she's magically tethered to the gods is the scene where she literally sings, in French, mind you, and it magically heals all of her troops. They cry as they behold the beauty of the Sky God's prodigy. And it's fully French. This scene comes out of left field, makes virtually no sense, has no reason to be included with such drama and profoundness as if we've just witnessed a rebirth or something. Unless we legitimately have. This is yet another example of a musical cult. Don't tell me that French song is not a meme, because it's a prime example. It's a French classic, and this scene reeks of meme material. It's all French. Mort is the target, and he is death. He'll claim the souls of anyone he can. His own team was in a car, hanging over the edge of a damn roof, all terrified, and Mort's just delighted at the prospect of spirits for his collection. Look at that! Face. Dubois is an evolved, animalistic commander of the organization and is the result of Sky God desperation so intense they've created Satan. We see the fire and horns and maybe even the tail during her introduction and it's possible she has recruited other redheads like Alice. We know she's a step up from law enforcement because she calls the policemen stupid bozos as opposed to her being a step down, like your typical animal control officer. And again, she's bizarrely famous in Monaco. It's her territory and the monkeys themselves state that French labor laws are different from the rest of the world. I will repeat once more that Alice of the Central Park Zoo is directly tied in here as she literally calls in secret agencies to suppress the penguins. Officer X is a part of this, thank you to many commenters. The penguins of Madagascar alone borders on canonizing half my claims because its whole focus is animal intelligence up close and personal with aggressive humans out to get them. The Central Park Zoo is a feet outpost, which is exactly why Dubois is so comfortable killing there. But each member has their own place, some know more than others, Mort is merely the overarching goal, whether one member or another knows it or not. They only have one focus, and it's their own desperation. As Montgomery himself says following his assault on animal intelligence, This is an unholy perversion of the balance of nature, Vince. By the way, I haven't forgotten about the Verminator Terminator Dwayne LaFontante himself. This guy, of course, has the same tracking abilities as Dubois, but he somehow has access to a weapon so powerful, and he employs it so nonchalantly. It has the ability to create what equates to a supernova that breaks the laws of luminous flux, and there's a reason we get a view of it from outer space itself, the territory of the gods demanding it. This is a supernova blast designed to kill an elder god. Obviously, with Over the Hedge being our original light bulb moment, we also know all about the suburbs suppressing the forest animals, blah 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 blah, but I would like to highlight that Hammy is granted supernatural powers upon drinking the soda, and considering he's directly an enemy of the feet, and considering he's also a small rodent-esque animal, I think we might at least have one more semi-solid link between Mort and animal intelligence. This all of course just goes to show how expendable the feet are in the eyes of their own gods, like how Dubois was abandoned after her failure and left as sacrificial food. Lastly, in this insane video, is the one that seems to be important but refuses to fit cleanly. Kung Fu Panda is all about balance. We discussed previously how it quickly becomes clear upon any amount of theorizing that it must take place in a world without humans implying post-humans. 
This is because, again, they use human technology and skills, Kung Fu for example, but it's far more supernatural in nature, and they all speak English in China. If this ties in like I assume it does, then it would imply this is the fallout of some cataclysmic decimation of humanity. The Great Reaping. I don't have nearly as much evidence for this, but I know it's somewhat important, so I'm absolutely going to keep it all in mind. Give me evidence from the Kung Fu Panda TV show. I remember getting a comment on a Kung Fu Panda video a while back, like in 2016, saying that Vern from Over the Hedge is actually Ugwe, but I can't possibly comment on whether or not that's the case. I mean, I suppose it's sensible, given that Ugwe created Kung Fu and the New World Order, and Over the Hedge's ending indicates that Vern is a key player in the uprising, but what I can say is that if you have anything to say about any DreamWorks show or films, comment it now. And more specifically, if you have anything from the Penguins of Madagascar TV show that you think can tie into all this, then comment it absolutely because this just got so much bigger. The big one that you don't have to mention, though, is Vincent, who we saw in the Bee movie. As a victim of the feat, he was included in the Bee trial to defeat humanity. But that's likely just the cherry on top of our remarkably solid foundation anyways. Also, also, many people have asked me over the years, as I have promised over the years, to discuss how Lord Farquaad's ghost works. This is how. As a prime founder of the feat, he is granted supernatural life extension. Absolute answer. And who kills him? Who has the power to break his spirit? Why, an intelligent beast, of course. Also, finally looping back to where we started, the Monsters vs. Aliens general claims to be 90 years old. Life extension. And now he's the advisor to President Hathaway. So we're not close to done, obviously. There aren't even like half the DreamWorks films here, and there's still so much more depth to go into here. If you've seen the previous video, part 21, then you know this. But what if I told you that it goes even deeper than that? What if I told you that it goes so deep that I'm on the threshold of snapping because of my utter befuddlement at the fact that these patterns shouldn't logically exist, but here they are doing it anyways. The amount of evidence I found. You are seconds away from one of the most insane videos you'll ever see. I'm the theorizer, and I wanted more information on the musical side of this feat cult. I wanted to dig into them some more. And you might recall that initially this organization stemmed from the Shrek films. This cult contains all of the villains and half of the side characters. Reggie, Robin Hood, Fairy Godmother Charming Merlin. But here's where things are about to take a turn. I thought it was kind of funny and dumb when I made that original musical meme cult theory. It's a legitimate theory, but still presented quite silly. But by now, though, you should understand just how real it is. And here comes an absolute flood of additional proof that this is a thing that exists. Let me introduce you to our next massive puzzle piece, the Pied Piper. In Shrek 4, Rumpelstiltskin hires an animal control bounty hunter who uses a flute to play music that supernaturally controls all of the animals around him by assimilating them into a dancing cult. This is almost the perfect evidence. Like, really? A bounty hunter who magically controls animals with music? This is my exact theory. This should also sound quite familiar to another self-proclaimed animal control officer, Chantel Dubois, who is a critical member of the FEET organization, as we've established. You know, I'll call the members footmen, because that's easier and already a word, so my script won't autocorrect, of course. Also, once again, we see that hairstyle that's a little similar to Reggie and Robin Hood and Farquaad, and come to think of it, some of the villagers who are out to hunt Shrek at the beginning of the first film, which is also something new, I noticed. But there is, oh, so much more. I can feel it. I started rummaging around the other films, and then it hit me. 
How did I miss this before? You know how Duloc is an important stronghold for the organization because of Lord Farquaad? Remember that, right? Well, take a guess how Duloc introduces its visitors. It greets them with a song that passive-aggressively tells them to stay in line. This is beat for beat a musical cult. If you somehow didn't believe me before, do you believe me now? We have more than enough evidence, really, but I'm not done. I want everything. So I watched through the films yet again and paid closer attention to Shrek's big moment in the third film. He's about to go on stage, and it's interrupted when his butt gets scratched with a musical instrument by a man literally named Fiddlesworth. This is like some, some sort of nightmare. It's like the universe is taunting me, and here's just the thing. It keeps going. The second film's entire climax is literally the fairy godmother, esteemed member of the feet, peaking her evil plans with a musical number. Honestly, why is this happening to me? A whole entire orchestra appears behind her as she sings into her magic wand and rolls across a piano. The musical, magical, misotheric evil is everywhere. I had to take a break from watching, so I descended into the comments section of part 21 and immediately found a comment from user Isabella Danell, who highlighted the fact that Shrek 3 ends in almost the exact same way, when the godmother's son, Prince Charming, plans out an entire musical play in which he will publicly execute Shrek the Intelligent Beast, the target of the organization. Charming's whole life has been musical and dramatic, he even defaulted to theater after his mother died, which makes sense given everything I've been saying, so then I decided to go in and take a closer look for myself, and I damn near fainted, when I realized what was really happening. If you know anything about classical music, then you probably know of the very famous song, Danse Macabre, by Camille Saint-Saëns. This is what Charming sings half of his musical to. If you couldn't tell already, this is the missing link. Danse Macabre is French. <sighs> Care to guess what the song's about? It notoriously means Dance of Death. It famously details the Grim Reaper resurrecting the dead so they can dance on their own graves. They had thousands of songs to choose from for the big moment in a musical where the human kills the beast rising to power, and they chose this one. This song about Mort. If you're not acknowledging the musical cult at this point, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know what to tell you. Oh, wait. <laughs> yes, I do. Here's some more evidence. Shrek 3 did a lot of things and played a critical role in my original discovery of the music cult, so I kept looking, and it dawned on me that I'd been ignoring Captain Hook up until this point. What caught my eye again was that pesky hairstyle, but that's not what I'm here for today, no. I'm here to expose him for his more significant ties to the cult, because he's always playing that piano. Always, always, always. This surprised me. But what really got me was when they roll it all the way out into the wilderness just for their fight with Shrek. Why do they do this? What a waste of time and resources, unless it's truly important. And here's just the thing. The instant they roll it out, Donkey screams. Look out! I got a piano! The absolute terror on his face. Donkey knows about the cult somehow on some level in some way. I mean, let's see. First of all, he's one of the main intelligent animals in the Shrek films, so much so that he was the big introduction to the concept when they were all surprised he could talk. He's also constantly doing what? Singing. Just walking around, singing to himself. When Shrek asked for Farquaad's location, Donkey was one of the only characters to know the answer, let alone say it. And Farquaad, of course, is a critical footman. So now you're seeing why I included my donkey theories in the playlist. He has a number of horrific stories about his past, and I wonder if he was bred as sacrificial food or something, but more of that stuff in part 23. Tying this back around, we can reasonably assume that it would connect to Captain Hook and his piano as well. And take a wild guess, who hijacks the piano mid-song during their battle? Merlin, one of the main magicians I deemed responsible for the musical cult's existence. Then, when Shrek blows up the piano with his cannon, what happens? All of the enemies freeze, 
panic and then run away as fast as they can. The music, their connection to the gods, their upper hand has been severed. The music stops and they're gone. The music serves as a link, but more on that too in part 23. Because are you satisfied with the music cult yet? Well, I was still hungry for more. And you know, this scene really did get me thinking about pianos, so I hopped back over to that final scene from Shrek 2 one last time when the godmother's rolling across her piano, and I felt like something important was going on when she tells her pianist, Kyle, C minor, put it in C minor. She says it right before her performance because the film has made a point of her being musically aware. Quite interestingly, Kyle proceeds to put it in G minor, which is how she ends up singing I Need a Hero. And so I did ask on Twitter if any of you could tell me whether Hook's songs were in either C or G minor, and it seems like some of them, namely the battle scene, are, but that's more coincidental than anything. Less coincidental, though, is the fact that Dance Macabre is in G minor, and it also was a climax song, but I digress. Do with that what you will. No. By returning to the Shrek 2 climax, more than anything, I was interested in what she's actually saying in her song. They chose an interesting song for this climax. Considering it was almost begging for Shrek to come dashing in, and they have a track record of phenomenally specific songs like Accidentally in Love, so I examined the lyrics and found parallels that intimately describe exactly the sorts of things I've been saying. Sky God parallels. The most important lyrics include, where are all the gods? Somewhere just beyond my reach, there's someone reaching back for me. Racing on the thunder and rising with the heat. Up where the mountains meet the heavens above. Out where the lightning splits the sea. I could swear there is someone somewhere watching me. Through the wind and the chill and the rain and the storm and the flood. This is all too suspicious. And I'm terrified. If this still isn't enough... Well, the first two films both end with musical numbers, I'm a Believer and Living La Vida Loca. There's also bonus features on the DVDs, with the first film having a whole karaoke party, and the second film having it too, in the form of a singing competition in which Simon Cowell arrives and judges the main cast. Are you kidding? I mean, I don't think it's literally Simon Cowell, but it's most certainly some sort of musical judge from far, far away, and it, I mean, it is in fact voiced by Simon Cowell, and they call him Simon. The canonicity of these aren't to be dismissed either, as they even bridge gaps between both Charming and Doris's character arcs of the second and third films. Still, it's not linchpin evidence, keep that in mind. It is support for the overwhelming rest of the evidence. And by now, it should be clear. This cult is real. Their music is real. Their goal is serious. They hate intelligent beasts. I say beast because the word choice could theoretically include all animals and fairy tale creatures or monsters. The point is, organic non-human intelligence. Robin Hood uses such words as well when he says foul beast, and so does Prince Charming and half of the Shrek cast, including people like Rumpelstiltskin, where he claims the Pied Piper's music will soothe the savage beast, which finally transitions us out of this musical madness and into the next phase of evidence. If you haven't guessed by now, the Shrek films are far more critical than you can possibly imagine, and Rumpelstiltskin is where we'll start with the next chunk of this. We established way back in my fairy godmother theories, you know, somewhere around part eight of all this madness, that Rumpelstiltskin's plans involved everything the fairy godmother had plotted, and that the fairy godmother's plans included everything that Lord Farquaad had plotted. Rumpelstiltskin's at the top of this hierarchy. Not all members of this organization have the same goal. Remember, there's lots of overlap in goals and tactics and communication, but I mean, I almost referred to this organization as a freelance one because the Sky Gods manipulate and bend and twist and lie to this disorganized organization so long as their goals are met. The biggest manipulation tactic they use is, of course, the hatred of animals, which persuades many humans, but not all. In fact, their target is Mort, and they can often achieve that without the help of humans and sometimes even with the help of animals. This is important, and with that said, Rumpelstiltskin is probably the closest to the Feet organization, giving him being at the top of the manipulation chain. They're all footmen in their own right, but Rumpel's quite interesting and worth more of a delve. When his evil plans engage, so too does the creepy lightning, which, plot twist, could very well be courtesy of the Sky Gods. And here he proceeds to hyperventilate as Shrek signs his contract, and I kid you not, his actual feet rip through his shoes and dig into the ground. I was already in a panicked state, and I hadn't realized I'd turned the audio into French when I was watching, so when he started saying sign and it sounded like sing, I nearly fell out of my chair. 
An important thing to note about Rumpelstiltskin is that he's more of a magical creature than a human. We established aliens and other creatures as wild cards in the eyes of the organization, and thus they can go either way. This is why I made that point about the Sky God's goals and how things aren't exactly black and white. Rumpel, though, he's quite clearly a member of Feet. First of all, he hires the Pied Piper, and he himself laughs about musical manipulation, which is something he seems interested by to the point where he sets up a damn nightclub in his castle. There's also the big one, which is that he has, well, red hair. As you may notice, this is one of the smaller connections, but it's made much larger when the film makes a huge point about his hair when he gets a fiery wig, quite reminiscent of Devil Dubois. He also makes devil deal contracts that transcend universes, but honestly, that's more like more than anyone. <laughs> yes, if we want to truly highlight Rumpelstiltskin, there needs to be a really big, really interesting plot thread involved. Luckily, I have that video where I dissected Shrek 4's triple timeline, and I think I've found something new. In Shrek 4, Rumpel planned out a massive scheme in which he tricked Shrek and bent space-time to his will. This film is one of the only other times that the multiverse becomes a critical focal point aside from All Hail King Julian. This is different though, because what again was the result of this Shrek 4 parallel universe? Well, it was apocalyptic. Animals enslaved, ogres hunted, Rumpel in charge, everything destroyed in favor of dystopian control and order. This is, generally speaking, the sort of devastated world that would likely result from trying to get a grip on things like animal intelligence to hold back something that advanced, just to get enough time to split Mort yet again. It's a dystopia. Mort is chaos, but this is too much order. It's a dictatorship that doesn't care about, well, much of anything at all. It's one of many feat endgames, and a lot had to happen to get it to work. Rumpel's scheme alone wasn't enough. On its own, he needed Shrek's willing participation. It was a miracle that it all played out, and I mean that literally. Let me explain. Shrek went back to Far Far Away following months of boring, dull repetition in his life. It was almost the exact same day, repeated over and over and over again. This was the catalyst for the rest of Shrek 4, and it drove Shrek nearly insane. This is all a reference to the oft-mundanity of family life, except it's more than that. At the very, very, very beginning of the film, Shrek is fine. He's already been doing this for ages, but it's only when the film starts that he begins losing his mind, or more specifically, after that first day. So darn it, I delved and rewatched that entire first day. I thought I couldn't find anything, and then my jaw almost dropped off of my skull. It was the Sky Gods that did this. So, what did you wish for? That every day could be like this one. What in the fuck? The Sky Gods literalized his wife's wish in simultaneity with Rumpel's cold open vengeance scheme and put Shrek in a vague, looping hell state so he'd cave at the slightest provocation and bootstrap the apocalypse. Ogre for a day, my ass. How's that for a metaphysical paradox? Alright, so we've seen some good evidence and flimsy evidence, but all interesting points nonetheless, and it just begs the question, how much of the Shrek films are a conspiracy? When I told you they were important, I wasn't lying. They're almost as crucial as Madagascar is. It's like, in this time period, the Sky Gods are desperate and in full effect. We already know of some smaller manipulations, like how the Fairy Godmother actually wanted Shrek to save Fiona, but what else could there be? I often lay awake at night, asking myself, how did Shrek have Fiona's fairy tale book all the way out in his swamp? And he did, by the way, it wasn't just for kicks in the intro, because later he references it when in the Dragon's Keep. I've even asked myself about how Charming knew the appearance of Shrek's swamp so he could involve it in his musical. Does it have something to do with that moment when Reggie and the trumpeters sort of just waddled behind Shrek's house at the beginning of the second film? One time I even questioned the largest of these possible manipulations. How did Arthur's classmates know to play All-Star? Yes, if you recall from the Reggie theory, the band plays All-Star when Shrek enters the school, but how? How do they know to do this? Conspiracies everywhere, I'm telling you. For this video, I decided there was one relevant enough to the Feet cult to warrant an entire section, and that would be on the matter of King Harold. You may remember when I absurdly claimed that Reggie assassinated the king back in, what was it, part 12? Well, I've come to the understanding that he might not have, but someone he's affiliated with most certainly did, unintentionally or not. You see, King Harold was turned from a frog into a human by the fairy godmother's magic. 
He turned back when she died, and it probably didn't help that he was slammed with her energy blast. His transformation and reverse transformation are, as I understand it, a magical manipulation that is not permitted. He's changing states, and one might argue, changing sides, using the magic that the fairy godmother funnels from the sky gods themselves. This is a disrespect of the highest order, and I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't the godmother's magic that killed her, but rather the sky gods snapping their tether and thus annihilating her for her failure. Harold goes differently. Without the magical connection, he slowly withers away as an impossibly old frog, unless of course they sped up the process by having someone like Prince Charming kill him with poison. There are no accidents, to quote a possible warlord. And as these other intelligent frogs literally sing, Live or let die. <laughs> Hashtag in before the mort. Charming, you see. He watches this funeral from a distance, and considering his plans with Rapunzel must have spanned a significant amount of time that we never got to see, it means Charming could have already been working on this prior to his declaration of vengeance, but this is all speculation. There's one massive connection King Harold has, one critical link so shocking and bizarre that I'm not sure what to make of it. It could be nothing or it could be everything, so pay attention. Chantel Dubois, one of the most famous footmen around, the definition of an exterminator terminator. I showed Chantel Dubois so many times in part 21, here, there, everywhere, and I somehow missed the obvious. Pineapple is literally on her hat. <laughs> she never once removes this hat in the time we get to see her, and I I can't believe I missed this, but the commenters certainly did, and a few people have brought it to my attention now. She bears the symbol of her leaders. Here's just the thing. I know this is flimsy, but it's not nearly as flimsy as you think it is. I want to clarify that this is not a fleur-de-lis, but if it were, it would also be evidence, and here's why. For those who don't know what I'm talking about, I hadn't realized it either until commenter Red Panda Boy pointed it out, but Prince Charming's main outfit is covered in fleur-de-lis symbology. Real fleur-de-lis symbology. You can find them frequently in DreamWorks, but mostly in the Shrek films around Far Far Away. This is noteworthy because what is a fleur-de-lis? Well, it's a very famous symbol that is French. There's more, so prepare yourself. This famous French symbol is largely on medieval French things, most notably the flag itself. It bears a mild resemblance to pineapple, which I guess would make sense if, if the sky gods are tied to France. And I already rewrote real-life Madagascarian history in part 21, so... But again, its resemblance to pineapple is really mild. The symbol on Dubois' hat, if not pineapple, is instead maybe a sort of parodied cross between a pineapple and a fleur-de-lis, which would only help my case yet further. So what does the fleur-de-lis represent exactly? Here's the mind screw. It represents a lily. This realization hit me funny, and then I realized why. King Harold, as a frog, claimed to have lived in a lily pond before marrying his wife, Queen Lillian. Is there any tie between him and the physical symbol, though? Yes. I scanned as hard as I could, and then I finally realized that it was right under my nose the entire time. His crown is covered in iterated fleur-de-lis symbols that are modified into a parodied pineapple shape. Again, have I lost it? Have I lost it? My point is that there's something here, somewhere here. The, the dilemma is that you theoretically could construe this one in many ways, but the fact of the matter is that if it is construed as valuable evidence, it would be the single best evidence yet. Both of these notions cancel out, however, and thus I see this as more or less just another pin in the corkboard. Nothing overly special because of the possibility of it literally being nothing, but I can't dismiss it either because the context of this is critical. You see, this crown is worn by the kings of Far Far Away, as we see both Charming and Arthur wear it following Harold's death. This means it was worn by those terrifying previous royals I blabbed on about in the Fairy Godmother videos, and thus that whatever this intends to represent would be theirs. This could imply a number of shocking things, such as a schism in the feet, considering the Fairy Godmother was a part of it too, but this will, as with many things, be reserved for the logic segments of this massive theory, where I will fill the vastly numerous holes I've created for myself by finding all these connections. Alright, back to the main video. To put all of this King Harold stuff simply, the Sky Gods were somehow involved in his death, intentionally or not. 
Charming then took his rightful place, but was of course killed by his own musical prop in the climax of film 3. I would like to finally note here that the Sky Gods have supernatural life extension in full swing during all of this. Charming stares up at the falling tower and questions, Mummy? before being crushed to death. It's my understanding that he literally saw her as he was seconds from death and is a footman. If you recall the very ending of part 21, I brought up the matter of Farquaad's ghost and how he too was granted life extension. It's the opposite of Mort, and it's the Sky God's ace up their sleeve. I've realized since then that he truly seemed to believe that if he killed Fiona, she'd want to become his queen of the underworld. He wasn't exaggerating. This only pans out if he somehow has control of her spirits, which is even more proof that something's going on, because why would his ghost be all that special? Finally, look at the way Farquaad is destroyed. Dragon blasts his soul into a dozen smaller spirits. Tell me this isn't word for word how I described Mort. That is, largely all of the Shrek evidence. Hello. I'm the Theorizer, and with the previous video, we finally have the majority of Shrek out of the way. Not all of it, but here's where things are about to take a turn. These Sky Gods. The amount that they're doing, that they're getting away with, it's just ridiculous. We covered a lot in that video. The gods are manipulating musicians, turning their own footmen against one another, swapping sides, dictating fates, and jump-starting apocalypses. Who are they? I mean, we know that. We get a ton of it in All Hail King Julian, but I have more to say on this. They are called Sky Gods for a reason. They aren't just gods. They are the controllers of the sky. You know about the spooky lightning, but it goes far deeper than that. We even know about the ghosts and the magic they perpetuate, but that's still only like one level deep. We need to be much more aggressive. Here's where things are either going to get shocking or go too far, and that's with the sun and moon imagery. Give me one minute though, and you'll see just how solid this really is. There's the little things, like how Mort screams at the sun, or how there's a sun on the Duloc music cult. Wow. Flimsy is all hell. But we do know that the sun and moon are godly. It's all Hail King Julian stuff, but that moon, this moon, I'm telling you. Charming races to save Fiona in front of an abnormally large desert full moon. The night of the fairy godmother's blackmail is centered around an abnormally large omnipresent full moon. Shrek and Fiona enjoy their honeymoon while being watched across where the lightning splits the sea by a looming and aggressive abnormally large full moon. And then there's tons more too. This is just the Shrek films, mind you. I could go into detail with all the other appearances too, but it's always there. The moon is always there if you're watching any of the films I've been theorizing on, because every single time you start up one of these movies, you are greeted with exactly that. The DreamWorks moon. This is the ultimate sky god. This is the ultimate proof of a shared universe. Let me direct you back to All Hail King Julian, where I now have explicit reason to believe that the main character who's in tune with the universe has his very specific name for all these reasons. His name is Sage Moon Dancer. He and his bird are definitely a part of things, as I assumed long ago. More importantly though, can I direct you to the show's opening sequence, which centers around Julian. As we've repeatedly established, Pineapple contains all of the souls of the previous Lemur Kings, and of course is also the leader of the gods. Our Julian is the prized possession of the gods, and it finally hit me because there he is, sitting on the DreamWorks moon, fishing and catching... <sighs> who do you think? Mort. Mort's also the one who flies into the logo and replaces the eye in King, stealing the crown which this entire time has also resembled a pineapple. This show is called All Hail King Julian for a reason. Julian is a royal with godly blood in his veins, and this is about to become critical to my theories. You see, there's a reason Julian's feet do what they do to Mort. Just you wait. So, to put it simply, this moon is important. More shocking, though, is that it has a backstory. Or at least, it can. Perhaps the moon represents all of the sky gods at once, a symbol of the pantheon. We need more, and so as you might be able to tell, this is finally where Rise of the Guardians enters the picture. This movie follows Santa Claus, the Tooth Fairy, the Easter Bunny, and the Sandman as they're all spirits who were once alive and then sort of kept from death by the man in the moon. There are many other spirits too, but these few are the most physical and legendary, and they are referred to as Guardians. The film details Jack Frost evolving from regular 
Silver Spirit to Guardian, and the film's villain is a truly aggressive being known as Pitch Black, aka the Boogeyman, and the Guardians have to stop him. I hope you can see the parallels in how the Man in the Moon keeps people from death and then assimilates them because it's the exact same anti-mort capabilities that I've been theorizing the Sky Gods to have for ages now. These Guardians are there to comfort and raise the next generations of humanity, keeping them safe from the Boogeyman and such. I'm hesitant, however. Hesitant for the same reason I was hesitant to include my old Guardians theory in the playlist and still haven't, and the same reason I have yet to make another video on the film. This is miles more complex than the other films. You see, Rise of the Guardians is directly based off of the Guardians of Childhood book series, which is full of lore and its own backstories, but DreamWorks also has a track record of appropriating source material and merging them into prior conceived plot lines to their liking. Remember the film Home? Do you remember what I said about it in part 21? The aliens took up residence in Paris of all places? Well, commenter Retro Red made sure to highlight the true mind blow here, which is that the book Home is based on didn't take place in Paris. DreamWorks consciously changed it. Ah! <laughs> Another example of book continuity is Shrek, where I deemed that various characters had been adapted from the book improperly for a very strict reason. To put things as simply as I can, DreamWorks is taking elements and bending them to their own stories. This changes things, and even if you choose to defy their methods, my point in general is this. The Sky Gods are taking those who were reaped wrong and twisting them to their cause. This is the grand story across all DreamWorks films you see. Each side is recruiting more and more forces from the other side, slowly compromising everything as humans regress into weaker and weaker states. This leads to more desperation and more underhandedness, and as I've already said a few times now, things are not black and white. And you know, hey, I'm just saying, if the Sky Gods created the Guardians, then it would stand to reason that Mort created the Boogeyman, and all it takes is one look at his weapon of choice, and you can see that I'm right on the f***ing mark. This moon, the moon we see recur everywhere imaginable, is not a moon. It is a sky god, or all sky gods. As tired as I am of the Shrek films at this point in the theory, one of the key moments I can highlight would be when two intelligent beasts sit next to each other, staring directly at it, as they point to mythical ancestral figures in various constellations scattered about. The moon, the heavens, the Mort constellations. And here's the ultimate Shrek bombshell insofar as it wraps back around to my original theory on Fiona from 2016. It just hit me that her curse only affects her when the sun goes down, which is 100% consistent with the idea that the fairy godmother cursed her to begin with because she derives her magic from the sky gods who primarily take the collective form of the moon, and thus their focus would be somewhat increased at night. We've reached the point in these connection segments, part 17, part 21, part 22, part 23, where there's been so much evidence, some amazing, some mediocre, but still so much, that... <laughs> I'm on the threshold of exploding, like an explosion. <laughs> if you've been following the series to any extent, you know my reactions are warranted. <laughs> I'm struggling to parse through a few things because the line is blurring at this point, so much so that when I started watching the animation tests, I swear I started seeing things like Pineapple and Lord Farquaad's Invisible Crown, so I need to ground myself. We know lots about the Sky Gods, now it's time for me to lampoon them. Shit's about to get juicy, because their fishy-ass dream ain't working. You see, we may loosely know who they are and what they've done, but their behavior is particularly repugnant. I am referring, of course, to their demand for sacrifices. They relish in such things, and have even presented their enemies with peace offerings in the form of sacrificial food. Chantal Dubois, need I say more? Yes. The penguins. These four creatures are out for blood like you wouldn't believe. Both sides of this battle are so focused on this murderous behavior, and you can see this when the penguins joke about having killed the freighter crew and eaten their livers. Gloria looks shocked, and Skipper claims that they in fact just sent the crew off to China on a lifeboat. Honestly, either of those could be true, and either would be interesting, but I've still yet to incorporate China and Kung Fu Panda into this subject. Time. More notable, then, is when they try murdering the old woman almost constantly in the second Madagascar film. They try ramming her down with a car, and then a plane, and when she doesn't die, they hit her again. Of course, you may recall that Nana is an integral part of the Feet cult, as I've been saying for ages now, so it makes sense, I suppose, but the penguins are no less bloodthirsty for others. Funny enough, I recently stumbled upon a theory on Reddit that was based off of mine from user James the Ice Queen, who looked at all the data and determined that Madagascar could very well be the afterlife. Now, that's very noteworthy, but it doesn't fully pan out because of a variety of things we see in All Hail King Julian. What does pan out, though, is something that was uncovered by them in the replies. I wouldn't have caught it if not for Twitter user at Ridley GT though, so credit where credit's due, but this idea that each penguin represents a different horseman of the apocalypse, well, it would answer a large number of questions I've been having about
about the topic. I don't know about the other two, but Rico and Skipper almost eerily fit the descriptions of war and famine, and I think it was Rico's bottomless stomach that really got me. I don't know though, we'll have to see how things play out, but these important supernatural figures will likely come into play eventually, one way or another. The point in all of this is that the Sky Gods are bloodthirsty, the Penguins are bloodthirsty, Mort is bloodthirsty, and yes, as I've mentioned multiple times before, I have indeed seen the Penguins post credit scene where Mort basically eats King Julian whole after being transfused with a crap ton of mutated genes. This scene does add to the idea that the films agree with All Hail King Julian's depiction of Mort, but also that Mort is involved in the sacrificial food business. I will say that this isn't permanent though, Julian isn't dead here, and he was likely fine afterwards. Though remember last time when I said Donkey could have been sacrificial food? Well, you're not gonna believe this, but in Shrek 4, the ogres literally tie Donkey up to eat him, and he claims that he goes down smooth but comes out fighting. This implies that Donkey somehow has knowledge of what it's like to be eaten, and it is disturbing. How is everything coming true? How- <gasps> I'd have to say, though, that the Sky God's most bloodthirsty moment would also come from the films, which is surprising. Or is it? Yes, in the second film, you may recall the climax where Julian convinced Melman to sacrifice himself to the Sky Gods by jumping into the volcano with the hopes that the river would start flowing again. That's literally exactly how they describe it in the film. Commenter Mad May pointed out that it was literally a footman who blocked the river to begin with, and that's true, it was Nana. This sent me on a bewildering tangent like you won't believe. I had always thought that Nana was in the KGB, remember? Well, I'm now more than ever certain that she's actually in feet. You see, like Dubois, I believe Nana has been preparing for this moment her entire life. She instantly sets up camp and plans to eat lions. She claims it tastes like chicken, which means that she, like Dubois, was trained from an early age to go after Alex specifically. Go after him as food. There it is again, the sacrifice. In my theory on her, I claimed she went to Africa annually, and now we know why. It was stated that she ends the film by taking Makunga home, somehow, and now we know what she actually plans to do with him. Tastes like chicken. On top of this, Melman never actually does sacrifice himself to the Sky Gods and everyone leaves before once again the mind screw sets in. If you've seen the film, then you know exactly what happens next. Mort, after being absent for the entire film, shows up with a shark that has somehow been chasing him across the savannah from the coastline as it's somehow magically still alive, and then he sacrifices that to the gods. Fire bursts up, reminiscent of Devil Dubois, and instantaneously the river starts flowing again. I believe the entire climax with the plane and the dam was supernaturally influenced by the Sky Gods in one way or another. We discussed in part 21 how they likely also did it in the third film's plane sequence, and there are tons of things they could have done here too. Miscommunication on the monkey chain, Nana with the purse, and a freak accident beheading Skipper's love life. Nana is such a footman it isn't even funny. Alex dances to the music and fulfills his Central Park Zoo training from the foot outpost it is, and Nana can't help but call it beautiful as it is music and it is holy. But it doesn't stop her, the greater forces do. Even her dog knows something's up as it tries horrifically murdering the penguins in the Christmas Caper special. It all clicks when you view these films through a lens of life versus death and gods versus mort. So those are all some really interesting points about the ways in which the Sky Gods deal with sacrifices, but I still haven't hit you with the biggest slap in the face to my clueless ass all year. In the Madagascar films, as well as All Hail King Julian, we witness most of the lemur's important discussions inside of the plane that crash-landed in the Baobab tree. This plane is full of human skeletons, and for decades, presumably, the royal lemur line has been using it as their throne room. This is the same plane they later modify and crash land twice. This plane, this thing that's at the center of some of the most important events in all of the Madagascar lore, it flew in from France. <laughs> <clears throat> Honestly, I can keep going. These French people flew in with a cookbook that instructs how to cook lemurs like the apparent sacrificial food they are. This is all on full display in the film, no less. This is all film lore. The continuity is shocking, it is devastating, it is horrific, I am speechless, and I ask one more time. Do you believe me now? Alright, so I'm starting to get a feel for why the Sky Gods most often represent themselves with fruit. It's a form easily consumed, even though they are the consumers. Remember that All Hail King Julian episode where the fruit flies tried killing everyone? Mort ate them and then became a fly. It was weird, and I think the fact that it now makes sense is even weirder. Sentient food 
is very prevalent here, almost as prevalent as the sacrifices, I'd say. When Alex first lands in Madagascar, what does he start seeing everywhere? Talking steak. You can't make this shit up. I swear it's all true, and it's not just in Madagascar either, it's everywhere. Literally, sacrificial foods. Namely, of course, where else but back to the Shrek films. Sentient foodstuffs include the animal crackers from Shrek 4, and the one fighting them, of course, the gingerbread man, who was created by the muffin man at Drury Lane. How do I know this is truly tied in? Well, during the gingerbread man's interrogation by Lord Farquaad, he claims that the muffin man's wife is hiding fairy tale characters from those who would destroy them. Farquaad then claims that he knows the Muffin Man. He knows some random man who lives across the continent and far, far away. Yeah, you better bet the Muffin Man is a footman too. How else? And when the gang visits the Muffin Man in Shrek 2, Drury Lane is a horror show of resurrecting the dead and granting supernatural life to inanimate objects with referential lightning. And the Muffin Man has a French accent. <laughs> Pinch me. Inch me. <laughs> we were done with Shrek. <laughs> Wake me up. This isn't happening. <laughs> French chefs greet the important guests with snail appetizers. Shrek tends to prefer the grosser things in life as he confronts the footman villagers back home by telling them that he planned to peel their skin in their livers and squeeze their eyes. Yikes, intelligent beast be beastly. There's more sacrificial food, and they call him a beast. Following the dinner scene, the godmother shows up from a brightly lit night sky as she sings a song so full of evidence that it isn't remotely funny. She gives Fiona a Bichon Frise, which is a French dog, and makes sure to specify the breed in her musical number before offering a chicken fricassee and telling Fiona to spoon someone on the moon and showing Prince Charles in Fiona's bathroom mirror, but more on that in a second. The godmother creates life. She makes furniture sentient, which is directly in line with all that that I've been saying. She probably created the enchanted trees too, and this is where all my dronky theories come in, considering we now know why her magic was powerful enough to permit their existence. In the godmother's factory, her own workers actively hate her tyrannical rule and are out to stop her in a unionized movement that's somewhat similar to the movement she helped create the meme cult. These are all very vague little pieces of evidence on their own, but not together. Together they add up. Even if the more coincidental ones add very little, you don't realize these sorts of things until you acknowledge that a ton of DreamWorks films end on dance sequences, which is no longer as ridiculous and boring as you thought it was. Or how about when the three pigs look up the fairy godmother's dress and say they see London, they see France? <laughs> I don't know where to draw the line, so I'm saying everything. I'll have to find a line, though. In the later parts where I will bring common sense into this, I will draw the line. And I fear that day. All right, we've gone from Shrek evidence on top of Shrek evidence on top of Shrek evidence to the theories on the moon to the theories on the sacrifices. Now we're finally on to the less clustered evidence. When editing part 21, I noticed something odd in the trivia section of the Monsters vs. Aliens wiki. It was legit, and thus I zoomed way in on it in my video, hoping all of you would see it, and most did, that being the fact that the general in Monsters vs. Aliens is literally wearing a Shrek Pin? As viewer at Lin Sensei pointed out on Twitter, it is indeed also surrounded by clouds, as you would expect from the Sky Gods. It is, in fact, the definitive form they take in most of the canon. Though, what are the details and logistics of this? How does this work in terms of overall timeline? What does it mean? I plan to get to this later, of course, as I have no idea at the moment. It shakes a few things up, but can also be discussed in the logic segments. I've also gotten a few comments about the villain of the boss, baby, whose name is literally Francis Francis. This is insane! This is insane! How has nobody spotted, at bare minimum, the French connections before? How in all these years am I honestly the first? A number of you have commented about Mr. Peabody and Sherman going back to medieval France, and there being an absolutely massive number of connections in it, but I'll tend to that in the next part because this theory is getting larger than anything I've ever made. Another pattern I realized upon a recent Megamind rewatch is when Metro Man pretends to be weakened near the beginning of the film, he randomly chooses copper to be the metal of his weakness, which I find quite fascinating considering a substantial part of Mort is infamously made of copper. Remember his genetics? That was one of the few things on the list. Metro Man also discusses non-corrosive metals, but I felt the need to cover the copper. Again, debate in the comments, but this would come as no surprise because of course Feet would want to recruit Metro Man. He's the pinnacle of forced evolution, given that he's essentially Superman. Even more evidence against Metro City is that they let Megamind orbit his own satellite, and they claim the city does pay the prison, but we're all past that now. No, what we need to discuss right now is more important than petty pins or copper. We need to get on a critical mystery. Todd. Remember this all hail King Julian character? He's a toddler, and so much more. As you may recall, he's a little baby lemur possessed by a devil, and he has two-sevenths of the deadly sins for parents. 
The show flips between the terms devil and demon, but considering the fire symbolism I keep highlighting throughout these last few videos with things like the maybe random flames on Charming's leotard, you know, there's evidence everywhere if you squint hard enough, but we know that Dubois has a more direct tie to the big one, which would imply to me that Todd is being possessed by a low-level functionary courtesy of Hell, or the Sky God's equivalent of Hell. They do reference it in the show, if I recall. Todd is possessed by a demon, but not just any demon. It's one that makes the exact same attack face as our dear old Mort, which would imply that they are tied. Here's the thing. Since the very first second I mentioned Todd, you've all been commenting how Todd is German for I shit you not. The word death. Okay. So first of all, this should be absolutely explicit confirmation that the creators of All Hail King Julian were aware that Mort's name means death, considering they now have two characters who look the same and act the same with the same name. We know the Penguin spin-off openly stated facts about Mort's name, but this should openly confirm that here as well. So then there can be a number of other possibilities, many of which you can probably guess off the top of your head. Is Todd's demon secretly the son of the original Mort? I think more likely Todd represents maybe the Antichrist or something. I, I don't I don't know. I honestly have no no idea. I have to go in and do a second rewatch of the show to get all the updated evidence, but each time the intro starts, my stomach sinks and I get tunnel vision from flashbacks of sheer overanalysis. I will cover Todd better next time, but absolutely comment if you have anything to say about him. For those who still don't think any of this massive shared universe was planned by DreamWorks, you're sort of missing the point. That's not the question. There's no reason that any of this should be able to connect. And yet here it is happening. Sometimes in a flimsy way, but sometimes to perfection. My shock is more at the fact that this has been never-ending, and the connections just keep coming. Flawlessly, as if the universe itself is taunting me, not DreamWorks. You're forgetting that at its core, this is all one extremely elaborate theory on All Hail King Julian, and how the writers found the exact same patterns in DreamWorks that I did, and then gave it all a backstory in the form of their show. This is a theory on that. And the purpose of doing all this isn't even the theory at this point, it's just seeing how shockingly deep this keeps connecting, because there's no reason it should be like this, and yet it is. It should be obvious at this point because the sheer volume of references and lines that point back to All Hail King Julian is shocking. At one point during this, I even started obsessing over whether Shrek's onion metaphor was a reference to the heaven fruits or something, because they're food, only to turn on Netflix and be greeted with this. Because I'm like an onion, Maurice. There's a lot of layers up in here. This is yet another another explicit reference back to everything, and the show is packed with it, far beyond what I discussed in those designated segments. It goes deep. The only way to undo these patterns is if DreamWorks were to scrub their films from history, which isn't going to happen. Don't worry about the logic and common sense of it all. Remember, I will fix that when the time comes and all of the evidence is on the table. Some of you were asking if I knew about the Mama Bear from Shrek being skinned alive by Lord Farquaad. And yes, I've been fully aware of this for several years, but it doesn't change much for this theory specifically. <laughs> Another element that I don't think anyone realizes is that not only is Baby Bear crying, but he's the only other character who raises his hand when Shrek asks where Lord Farquaad is, and then Papa Bear rapidly forces his hand down. I say this now to once again prove a point about detail and intent. They are clever. These writers openly aimed to be the anti-Disney, and it's pretty clear that they've succeeded if they've cranked human-animal relations back so far as to trigger a mass apocalyptic event, i.e. the eradication of humanity. Mama Bear is also suspicious, though, because I recall her also being in the karaoke sequence, canon versus canon, weird timelines, for the love of pineapple, the depth of this is destroying me harder than anything else. So now that we've gotten that massive disclaimer about common sense out of the way, I present to you for all your troubles a few answers. The biggest and most obvious one that has been plaguing me for ages now is the question, why music? I need to know the reason behind music and why these cults are using it. It clearly has magical ties if Merlin is any indication, and remember, Hook's piano blew up, leading to all of the villains running away as if their magical tie was severed. But I feel like the Sky Gods will give us a better answer here, so I went back yet again to the Madagascar films, and the answer hit me like a train. Julian spends the entirety of his existence living as a vessel of the gods and doing what? Dancing! He's constantly doing the move it move it and Mort clamps onto his feet to stop him from doing it! This is it! I was right with the piano! Music truly is 
how they communicate with the Sky Gods. Julian's entire character is that he has godly blood and he's a dancer. That's it. I'm speechless. You have to believe me, this is insane. Commenter Anna May probably puts it best because music literally is the universal language. I felt like there was even more though, and then a second train hit me. This is already canon. It was established in All Hail King Julian, the show that answers everything. That music is how they communicate with the gods. You called me crazy. Who's laughing now? There are wrinkles as expected. Some of the bigger wrinkles in all this are the intentions of various characters, like how the Sky Gods are out to destroy Mort, but they still befriend Smart Mort. There's a lot of overlap, and things, again, are not as black and white as they seem. If you think Mort clamping onto Julian's feet is a slight leap, take notice of how half the time Mort's musical endeavors are smug and cynical and full of disdain. A dance macabre. So I returned to the show yet again, and then a third train hit me. The Club Moist episode. Mort goes up on stage to sing a song, and the lyrics tell us exactly what I've been saying. Your feet make me weak when I'm dancing to the beat. There it is. Stop doubting these things. Julian is a being whose mere existence, by little fault of his own, keeps Mort suppressed. The feet are the key to dancing, and they are grounded like Mort. And this is our answer to both the music cult and the feet obsession. Last but not least, I have our final twists. Firstly, some more evidence that the Central Park Zoo is some sort of stronghold for suppressing animal intelligence. Obviously, there's the big evidence like Alice and the Mort plushies, but how about evidence from the films directly? Well, evidence that they know about the intelligence should come purely from the way they treat the gang. They keep them weak and pampered so as to suppress them and keep them docile. Do you remember the film I deemed to be a companion piece to Madagascar, Over the Hedge? Well, in it, the main plot line is the antithesis to this. RJ shows off how humans are getting pampered and weaker and losing mobility and devolving. Both sides are trying to suppress the other into extinction, and it seems to be working. Also, note the moon. Perhaps Vincent was the villain of the film for the same reason he was used at the Honey Trial. He's on the wrong side of this fight, but something's going on here. The suppression, the war, the timeline. Mm. Commenter Gavin Alexander Hernandez pointed out some of the most critical evidence I've seen from you all yet, and it's that the president from Monsters vs. Versus aliens literally greets aliens by blaring a musical meme on a piano for no reason. Musical meme alien team, I ask for one last time. How the fuck can someone disagree with this? He's been fully immersed in General Warmonger's propaganda, and as you were all eager to point out, the film's credit scene ends with him firing the nukes. End of humanity? I was instantly on board, but hold on a second. Remember, I'm feeling something off. All of the references feel like they're inverted. Something's going on here. Something's wrong. What is it? Oh no. I've been looking at it all wrong. Farquaad is short. Rumpel is short. Humans are getting weaker. Slowly devolving, devolving, and the gods are forcing it back and force evolving, but Shrek manages to get the throne anyways because... backwards this entire time. Humans don't suddenly go extinct from Mort and his forces. It's an insidious slow burn until animals take over. Kung Fu Panda isn't just in the future. Shrek is too. They call things medieval in the Shrek films. Why? That word didn't come around until long after the actual medieval times. Prince Charles on the wall? How can he exist in a past that doesn't? Oh goodness, could Far Far Away be the actual Hollywood repurposing Disneyland into legitimization while they sing songs from the 2000s? A frog became human and usurped the throne. Animals are getting happy endings. What is going on here? Why are the Mort forces getting their happiness? Unless... Oh. Have I been wrong about Mort this entire time? He's not the villain. He's the good guy. Mort's been the hero all this time? He's just death. The devils are the enemy here. Oh, um, I, what 
The amount of holes in this I'm aware. I'm aware of how backwards and wild this sounds, and how it on the surface changes the origin of the music cult, but there are equally as many holes if the timeline was forwards, and Madagascar always seems to be the origin anyways. The villains had tricked me into siding with them, and this is about to get wild. I will. Prove this. Next time, whenever that may be, I might discuss the Muffin Man's wife who was hiding fairy tale creatures, maybe the Magic Mirror's identity, and of course the rest of the films. This one's been a mess, but also can someone please find out which painting this is referencing? I've been looking, but I can only find the close, but not quite. Hello, I'm the Theorizer. And last we spoke here, you bore witness to the best theory video in existence, part 23. Even though I've taken two years to recover, today will be fallout from part 23, plus tying things into the renewed life of 24 and 25, followed by even more new evidence. Then I'm going to hit you with yet another customary series of plot twists and answers, but if you've seen part 23, then honestly, you're just as deep in this as I am, and I've got you right where I want you. So first, how on earth could Mort be the hero this whole time. I said this when we last spoke, and well, it's quite simple. Just take a look at everything he's done in comparison to the France-established Exterminator Terminators. While he is shifty, he seems to be controlled primarily by entities such as Smart Mort who keep the unruly variants in check. Mort as a whole is just death. No big deal, not really. He's supposed to be impartial. He reaps the souls of those who need it. He's mischievous, but he has his heroic moments. And he's not exactly on par with framing animals on his wall or installing deep filter turbos. I think a lot of my irrational hatred for Mort has deluded me, maybe. We're at a crossroads here. Before we can get solid on his morals, I have to also discuss the ramifications of this so-called backwards timeline I pulled out of my ass. Yeah, in part 23, you'll remember it slowly dawned on me that the, uh, the timeline could either be forwards or backwards. There's a good chance of both. It's equally possible. There's plenty of signs indicating that humans slowly devolve because of a variety of factors related to food, sky god's feet, you know the drill. Humans are getting weaker, fatter. Technology is doing everything for them. They're eating too much. And this whole theme of evolution and de-evolution is central to almost every single DreamWorks movie. It's a critical linchpin! <sighs> I can do this. I can stay calm. I know I can do it. We see fairly competent humans in the B-movie, Megamind, Turbo, but then they start to get more and more picky and subservient and idiotic, like in Over the Hedge in Madagascar. Shrek and How to Train Your Dragon are both sort of anomalies to be discussed, but I mean anything involving a literally regressed humanity is of suspicious placement. But if something's at the end of the timeline, you'll tend to see intelligent animals and desperate footmen littered throughout the movies. At the tail end, we'd be left with Kung Fu Panda, which is not only peak animal intelligence, but is also utterly devoid of any human traces. Obviously, this is a general outline, and prehistory with dumb animals can still exist, so this is not a specific timeline with exact dates. Yet. You see, for that, I'd have to watch every single DreamWorks movie and every single DreamWorks spin-off show, and then analyze each of them to their cores. <sighs> That means I'd have to watch all Hill King Julian all over again, which is why I've been holding off on posting this. Because that show gives me genuine panic attacks! So I have an idea. I will work my way through parts of all Hill King Julian again, but overall speaking, and certainly for all other DreamWorks properties following this video, I'm just going to keep relying on you guys. There's simply too much there to discuss. It's far too vast for even 100 parts. But now we have the tools to sort this. You know what evidence you need to comment. You know how to do it. And if it's relevant enough, I'll incorporate it into a future part. The logic segments where I sort out all the plot holes will be the most complicated, painstaking, and difficult set of videos you will ever be subjected to in the history of YouTube. And I guarantee half of you will dip out midway, but I demand perfection. So you will be the ones forced to poke specific holes in my theories when the time comes. Now with everything recapped and outlined, let's get into today's good shit that you've all been eagerly waiting for. We've established pretty well that the DreamWorks moon is the ultimate sky god, or possibly the entire pantheon itself. Maybe some sort of elaborate space station spotlight, if hints in my last video were any indication. There's a whole point I even referenced about an intelligent animal, Vincent, eating it like a sentient food. 
But the one thing I've been planning on covering for a while now is the symbolism behind each intro sequence. You've all been pleading for this as well, so I'll go fast. In Shark Tale, the fisherman uses a sentient worm. If you keep digging in Shrek 3, a bunch of thunderclouds cover the moon with a ray of sunshine beaming down on a critical footman. In the B-movie, straight up Mort Theory madness occurs when Seinfeld assaults the gods and steals their throne. Like, honest to god, tell me, if this is truly the moon, then how do they sit on it?! Kung Fu Panda straight up has no sky gods even left, of course, and Madagascar 2 has the animal's secret weapon, the penguins ambush and presumably murder the fishermen. Monsters vs. Aliens ties the aliens back into this theory when they attack the gods, and they straight up put the moon in space by How to Train Your Dragon. Megamind proves every single point about the sky gods' duality, don't even try me. And Kung Fu Panda 2 returns with Ugwe the Usurper, or possibly Vern, as some theories say, maybe more on that later. Rides of the Guardians, aligns the Guardians, the crew, it's what the f I told you, cave people petroglyphically worship the gods. Sherman, get your ass out of here, we ain't through with you yet. Penguins, what the f Antarctic ice embedded shit. More alien abduction. Poe is relatable when he reaches enlightenment by fucking accident. Trolls music bust baby human ties and DreamWorks itself is the gods. That's why the moon is the first letter. They created humanity. Dreams work at nighttime. All right, so obviously I'm already derailing. Let's slow back down and reel it back in by covering what my recent additions reveal. So. Part 25, Kung Fu Panda is fascinating because in the event of a backwards timeline, yeah, I can see the possibility of Vern being Uguay in some capacities, but I can't provide copious evidence for it. It would just be cool. What's more important here is the fact that the Chi is literal life force and we bear witness to some kind of heavenly afterlife. These are all central themes, but in a more literal lore sense, I believe that Kai is the key. He is among the last of his forces, reaping chi with his devil horns to restore humanity. I want you to sit calmly and just think about that for a moment. It's all literally true. This fits beautifully on all levels. This guy is the last of the feet, and he's a soul stealer. Legit. As far as Rise of the Guardians in Part 24 go, we already have of course covered most of it, but it's interesting that the Sandman is a kind of sun god, considering his boss is the opposite, and he makes dreams work. Allegedly, the books feature the moon being an alien, and the list goes on. But while it ties in, it's still dubious canon. The point is, all the themes are continuous. All of DreamWorks' films connect flawlessly, but we'll get specific with the logic segments. The, uh, the stuff most important to connect in here would be the new, new stuff. Ever since my Mort theories began, DreamWorks has been changing, almost as if in response. This is proven by two movies that I recently watched and were gobsmacked by. The Bad Guys and Puss in Boots 2. You see, my DreamWorks theory is so perfect that it automatically answers any and every single unanswered question from these films. Watch me solve the entire Bad Guys in one fell swoop with Mort Theory right now. The Bad Guys opens up with a moon rock falling to Earth. This obviously relates to the Sky Gods. The film is about a bunch of intelligent animals in a society mostly filled with humans. DreamWorks openly shows dumb animals too, even ones of the same species, and doesn't even try to explain it, because they already have. You see, later in the film, they reveal that the moon rock can augment consciousness and telepathy for animals, which leads me to believe that the moon has some connection to the animal's intelligence in this world. Duh. We also see a laboratory where they are testing on animals as such, and it's possible this organization is feet. A crucial character in this film is a red-headed, physically enhanced police officer. These augmented animals sing many times during police chases, critical scenes here, right? Giving animals human intelligence, scientifically or otherwise, puts them on par. But just like in Monsters vs. Aliens, there seems to be a power struggle within characters. Like Wolf, with his instincts to wag his tail being a critical plot point. The Sky Gods and Mort seem to be tugging at each other's forces, trying to convert them. The Sky Gods insidiously preach love, and the Moon Rock is even a heart. But it's all a lie. See, it all explains how Kung Fu Panda animals could damn well be humans mentally, animals physically. Another linchpin, this insidious infusion, filling animals with compassion and the human genome. Likewise, this gerbil uh, character's butler has literally been brain swapped with the gerbil. Do not tell me this isn't the case. I told you, I have all the answers. There are so many big moon shots in this film. There's this new organization called SUCM, which is deadass just feet. They're even ripping me off while they suck them feet. And consciousness implantation is the same pattern as to how they implant Megamind's brother into the fish's brain. This film explains it, and other films explain this. Beautiful. But Puss in Boots, now they're really going all out. 
All right, so DreamWorks has changed their whole animation style and film messages in the past three years or so. It was good that I waited because in Puss in Boots 2, we see the wishing star that Fiona wished upon falling to earth and proceeding to attract a few dozen criminals to wish upon it with the beautiful little song. This is the Sky Gods. And if you haven't seen the film, you're about to be blown the fuck away because uh, DreamWorks has made the executive decision to, for the first time in almost 30 years, introduce a character that is none other than the Grim Reaper himself, who, I sh** you not, introduces himself as I don't mean it metaphorically, or rhetorically, or poetically, or theoretically, or in any other fancy way. I'm death straight up. Who did they put up against the Grim Reaper? Who did they put up against him? Why, the only character I've treated as more of an enigma than Mort... Puss in Boots. The one who transcends cannons to sing in the spin-off. This wolf is either a Sky God proxy, or a direct fragment of Mort. There's no disproving going on here, it all just really confirms it. He's much alike Pitch Black or Kai from Kung Fu Panda. Moons resemble scythes too, the figure of death. And this is proven outright and utterly by the fact that he's a wolf and Puss is a cat. In many cultures, notably that of Puss, the Grim Reaper takes the form of the thing the victim fears most. It's a cliche cat versus dog. Dead ass fragment just like the wishing star, or the literal voices in Puss's head that the wolf so aggressively smashes because it reminds him of himself reabsorbing, perhaps? Yes! But don't even get me started on Jack Horner. He's the most based f***er this side of the inverted timeline, who is so feet that it isn't even funny because he somehow incorporates everything but the French connection. He is the living embodiment of what I describe footmen to be. He steals all of the magical artifacts, including the Godmother's wand. He wants all the power in the world, and at the end, he is crushed into the Wishing Star itself, which would imply by my theories that he either becomes a god, or depending on the timeline, has been the creator and head of feet this whole time. He screams in this film, I hate talking fairy tale animals! Again, as if DreamWorks has seen my videos. He wants to be the bad guy, awful man. I love it. He quotes himself as being dead inside, much like Mort, and he's immune to the puppy's powers. This cute little dog seems to be sort of the opposite of death, also a dog, but the side of the coin that ultimately saves Puss in Boots' soul. They're telling us something here. Dreamworks, you sussy sacks of shit. Puss in Boots sings and dances like the pattern he is, and he joins a retirement home that weakens cats run by a woman named Luna. Like the moon? Holy shit. Jack Horner's base is an industrial machine akin to mankind's advancement or lack thereof. Jack wears devil horns like the Horner he is. This man straight up being the do the roar kid headass. Did they resurrect Mama Bear? Puss, nine lives because of the resurrection gods. This is the man after him. Jack sacrifices so many people in this movie. The Bakers doesn't like the Muffet Man who burnt Puss earlier to make the sacrificial foodstuffs. Fairy Godmother's wand is a piece of the wishing star. I'm reaching a threshold of insanity not exactly comprehensible by human minds. I have predicted the next hundred years of films. This is my breaking point. Ready for the things I forgot in part 23? <sighs> Go. I believe the reason the fairy godmother's magic was reflected off of Harold is because he was wearing the royal outfit. Yes, the same royals who notoriously hated the fairy godmother and probably infused their clothing with defense mechanisms against her magic. Who knows? Maybe Charming's their son and she kidnapped him from birth like the fairy changeling she is, though I have no great evidence for that. Why am I going off the rails of stable psyche? This is about to implode. Ah, just the thing to ease my mind. Do you know what the word lemur means in Madagascar's language? Ghost. <laughs> Makes sense, given that Alex's help sign degraded into the hellish truth. And get a load of this shit. A group of dogs is called a pack, right? A group of birds is called a flock? Well, I shit you not. A group of lemurs is called a conspiracy. <laughs> Pray to the mother, the father, and the holy spirit pineapple. <laughs> they say in How to Train Your Dragon that the night furies are spawns of death. Mort likes souls because he's after the souls of someone's foot. When Donkey transforms back with the Sky God's magic, he literally gets picked up and dropped callously as if an invisible god is taunting him. Nana's dog has lived for decades because she's a footman with access to life extension. Basically, every DreamWorks film ends with a damn dance sequence. Nana is the Statue of Liberty, a copper French icon. Dr. Cockroach says his PhD is in 
dance as he unlocks the alien ship, which is somehow locked with a musical mechanism. Plus, get this, get this. This is why I didn't want to watch any of the spin-off shows. He literally resurrects... Finally, in part 23, I discussed how the Muffin Man from Shrek is actually a part of Feet and is a key member in the creation of sentient food stuff. I have come to the conclusion that he is a terroristic warlord out to destroy the monarchy. The answer? Milk. As I berated the Muffin Man on Twitter, user funny name pointed out what many in the comment sections have also observed, that, um, the tub of milk is just waiting there? They have it already! All prepped! Hot milk to fight Mongo! I do believe this is because the Muffin Man is a repeat threat. He must have some sort of an enormous industrial crematorium in his f***ing basement in order to create such a giant gingerbread man. Nobody has questioned this until now. The Muffin Man is a critical footman. Speaking of the Muffin Man and milk, string theory. By string theory, I mean answers. By answers, I start with the alien genome. So here's a critical question. Why do several important footmen all look so similar? The answer seems to be that again, they all share a dress code. This is of course more proof for it all being an organization, but many people have said it's coincidence. So is there any possible way I can prove to you all that it is objective? Yes. See, this is where Markiplier comes into the theory. This individual has, for lack of a better description, been assimilated by the meme cult in real life. Markiplier is of course the famous YouTube gamer, and has been memed repeatedly in the form of various DreamWorks characters. When I say real life meme cult, I'm exaggerating. I of course am referencing the real world nature of comedians and speaking truth to power or whatever shit. More simply put, the internet has joked continuously about Markiplier looking like tons of different DreamWorks characters. I mentioned this in part 21 as well. They all look the same. There's even one in the bad guys to the point where so many collectively agree and just make fun of it. And thus, my usage of their dress code evidence and them looking similar and being a part of the same thing is fairly valid because it's not just me saying it. People have seen it so much that it's become a genuine meme. It's there and everyone sees it. Therefore, it's objective. I do also find it phenomenally strange that the letter M is central to all the linchpins I've been covering in these videos. Music, memes, magic, Madagascar, moon, mort, mutation, medieval, and of course, misotheory, the hatred of animals. It keeps going and going and going in Markiplier, and it's coincidental to the point where I've considered just renaming this whole thing to M theory, more commonly known as string theory itself, as this is the DreamWorks theory of everything. Oh, perfection. Perfection. <laughs> We've done it. The evidence has reached completion. I thought I promised answers, though. Oh yeah, well, with all that said, all this updated evidence, those final connections, there seems to be something going on here. And I'm going to figure out what it is right now. It's time for the big answers. Not that I even have questions to base them off of at this point, but something's all wrong with this picture. Something catastrophic that must be uncovered before the logic segments. Some ultimate solution that's being dangled under my nose. If things truly are backwards, maybe... Wait, if I got it wrong? Indulge me, could Mort really be with feet? And the animals really be with the gods? The moon, the magic industrialization... Am I, am I losing it here? There's, you see, there's so much shit that can push it in either direction. Same for the morals and the timeline. But there are prevailing... Patterns. You see why this is- this is why we need the logic segments. It is becoming ever clearer that both ways could be possible on all fronts! Still, it's not the linchpin I've been looking for. If all this combines, more is still not the hero. This has officially been proven. There, there are no exact heroes here. That's moderately devastating. But again, bringing this together, the reversal, if the timeline is both backwards and forwards, perhaps it's somehow not based on events, but rather the movie release dates. That would explain the claymation and the 2D. It explains the newfound change in dimensionality and the low frame rates of 2020's DreamWorks edginess. Uh, this is a factor to be discussed, of course, but is it that linchpin I've been looking for? No. What's the plotline of every single DreamWorks film? Villains getting sick of their own evil. They don't want to be the bad guys anymore. I had this all written, and then I watched the new DreamWorks film where they took this and ran with it. They are opening up because everyone's ready. And this is why Jack Horner was so bluntly evil. The point was, he was unabashedly bad, unashamedly evil. This is the DreamWorks plot. The catastrophic clash of life and death, of good and of evil, spanning timelines, canons, and dimensions, as the beauty of death 
meets the suffering of life, and it brings destruction for the humans, animals, and aliens, and organizations all caught in the middle. I would say there is hope if bad guys seek redemption, but genomes are infusing, manipulations are occurring. If there's one colossal element that will doom everything, it's partly because this is all Mort's story. You see, Mort doesn't just seem to be one facet of this mayhem. He's the dreamer dreaming the dreamworks. We saw this in All Hail, but what I learned from the Horseman Hypothesis of Part 23 is that he's not just a clown, but the entire circus. Mort is the sentient embodiment of the biblical apocalypse. He's not merely death, but all four horsemen. This is why everything, despite Pantheon vibes, still rings true of Christianity elements because he is the end of days. He has a bottomless stomach like famine. He's a genetically anomalous mutated super virus that spreads across the multiverse like a pestilence. And he's a damn motherfucking war criminal. Mort is the doom of us all. But if he's a part of all this and fits so cleanly into their alignment, not simply because he's the dreamer, but also because of his roles in the story, it can only mean one thing. Mort is not some foreign eldritch entity, but was a sky god himself. What does he say? Where we come from, there are mangoes in the air. He was one of them. He was a sky god. The god of the apocalypse. It's the only thing that fits all the evidence. This also explains death offshoots as subordinates, but what purpose does this serve? Well, that's a bit clearer, as any tale will tell you, he must be the old one. The combination, the most powerful, the... Oh. The original. Oh. Their creator. Notice how he created his own pantheon, not to emulate the sky gods, but because he created them too. They represent the real fruits around him in his actual 3D world. They are his true children. They are his undoing, resulting in one final fundamental truth. The sacrificial fruits eaten. Mort ate the lesser gods, and so they shattered him across the void in trillions of pieces. He wields the scythe. He transcends the outers of space and the timeless timeline. His intelligence spreads out to the animal soldiers of the world, and his mortal enemy, the pineapple, just so happens to be the one who takes his place as the leader. Pineapple fruit that represents kings, father of the gods, titan of time, Mort is Kronos. You may think we're at the end of the video. We're not. The connection segments are finally coming to a close in spite of the fact there are likely millions more connections to be had even in the logic segments. If you haven't joined my Patreon, do so as soon as you can. Things are finally, finally heating up over there and you'll be the first to know things. If you do, it might, might start physics videos over there, who knows? But before you go, one last thing, almost forgot. Do you still somehow not believe that the gods and feet even exist? Well, I remembered one of the later entries in the Shrek lore. A short film DreamWorks made called Thriller Night. It starts by literally opening up with the DreamWorks moon fading into a real moon, which implies that the Sky Gods are about to do something big. We're back in Far Far Away for some reason, and Shrek comes barreling out of a movie theater screaming for the love of Jinji. He's terrified and crying because they just watched some sort of musical in the theater and found it to be a completely harrowing experience. As you may recall, this is due to music being the universal language. Shrek wanted something more creepy because it's apparently Halloween night. He says he wants zombies or something, and Donkey says that zombies can't sing, which is apparently something he knows about. Supernatural life granted with music? Well, Puss in Boots compromises and performs a scary musical to which suddenly the entire world's lights go out and everyone starts singing. This is poetry between opposing forces, the horror of Mort and the memes of the gods. Yes, Shrek gets mad and says, you know how I feel about spontaneous musical outbursts. Yes, Shrek, how does that make you feel? Everyone around them also starts singing and then we see a nearby graveyard where all of the members of Feet literally rise from their graves. All of them. This is supernatural life extension in full effect, and music is in control. A zombified Pied Piper arrives and starts playing Thriller by Michael Jackson. Shrek then realizes his entire family has been zombified as well, and everyone starts dancing in synchronicity. Shrek is being controlled as well, and he says, Oh no, not this, not dancing. They finish the song. Shrek snaps the pipes, and then all of his zombified friends corner him and try eating him like the sacrificial onion he is before the absolutely unthinkable happens. We zoom out of Shrek's mouth and he's screaming as loud as he can. It zooms out in the exact same, identical way that it did in Shrek 4, following his return to his universe. If you recall, I determined with great accuracy that this was all the doing of the Sky Gods who put him in a hell loop. We see here 
that Shrek has in fact slept through the previews for the musical, and the whole thing was a nightmare that ended in the exact same way as his previous hell loop, which is merely the cherry on top of this mountain of evidence that proves this whole thing was a setup by the Sky Gods to torment his protagonistic self once again. Shrek then realizes the previews are just ending, which means the musical has yet to even truly begin, and he screams yet again, meaning this entire overall situation is a hell loop in which he's forced to watch a musical. This. This is the whole theory right here. Thriller Night is a musical hell loop in the moonlight that is memeing Thriller, which itself is the modern dance macabre, and all of the footmen are being resurrected to torment an intelligent beast. The proof is absolute. It's being displayed on full effect. What started as a DreamWorks joke has supplanted itself into their subconscious, and now they can't help but fill their films with feet. Any further connections come from you guys. Comment everything in Await the Logic segments, no matter how long it takes. Let it be known. Mort is the Demon King Titan of the multiverse, locked in a battle with his interdimensional children and their international cult. And if you don't believe it at this point, then you're crazy.